small or uh, hard to really observe. Um, a little tip, like if, if you need to dissect a grass flower, uh, two things that kind of help with this if you're using a microscope. One is double-sided tape to keep stuff stuck in place. And the other thing is maybe a little bit of chewing gum stuck on the, on the slide plate to kind of hold stuff in place. So, um, just a little side plate there. But I kind of have been trying to focus on, um, with my, my grass ID book, um, characteristics you can see in the field and that are good for determining which of the look-like species you've got. So with some practice, you can get a pretty good eye for telling what, what a grass is at a distance even. Um, even like the, what I call, 50 mile an hour characteristics, where if you grab it by, you can see it in the you know it Okay, so yeah, it's like I said, as a first I'm gonna start with, talk a little bit about uh, features that are useful for grass identification. And then also we're going to talk a little bit about some notable uh, grasses that are important in wetlands. Okay, so if everybody's kind of familiar with uh, the general patterns of flowers, um, grasses have really reduced flowers. They're wind pollinated. Um, there are some important characteristics of the grass of the grass flower of the grass inflorescence to point out. So the individual unit of a grass inflorescence is a spike. And that consists of two blooms and then a number of florets. It may be one floret, maybe two florets, maybe a bunch of florets. And each one of those florets is basically the flower. So this is the flower inside here. These are modified bracts. Um, you've got the ovary, of course, and the stamens inside there. Now at the bottom here, the lodicles, that's thought to be the remnants of the perian. And what that does is, I'm sure you've seen that at certain stages in development, the grass it's kind of open up to release the pollen. Um, the function of the lodicles is that it's tissue that kind of swells and it pries apart the lemma, or the lemma and the palea that close the flora. Uh, some examples of different types of spikelets. This is Erichrostis, um, Cilianensis, I believe. So here we've got the, the glooms down at the bottom. The reduced scales that don't have any flowers in them. And we've got about a dozen florets in the spikelet. This is um, ciliate brome or fringe brome, brome ciliatus. Here we've got two blooms down at the bottom and on the spikelets, oh, six on spikelets. This is uh, Elopicurus carolinianus, uh, the uh, Carolina foxtail. Here we have the full spikelet. Here it is with the glooms pulled away from the floret. And notice this long on that's actually attached kind of back there. And this is uh, uh, Panthum malasium uh, millet. So this is the full floret. This is an example of a panicoid spikelet, which means it has two florets, but one of them is highly modified. So you've got a gloom, a second gloom, a sterile floret that may have anthers, may not, and then you've got the fertile floret. And the, the glooms and the sterile floret kind of wrap around the fertile floret. And here it is with the fertile floret part of pulled out. This is a species actually, usually this hisses as a unit, so the whole thing falls off the grass. But in this particular species, which is kind of a, kind of a bad weed in some crops, uh, you can see it actually falls out, making it kind of harder to control in uh, crop fields. So here's a couple examples of the inflorescences in grasses. This is Agrostis gigantea, common red top. Um, this is a pretty just nondescript panicle. So it's a, the panicle is kind of the inflorescence of the grass. This is a modified panicle that looks like a spike, but you can see there's these little branches to it. Does anybody recognize this grass, by the way? This is a non-native one. This is creepy meadow foxtail. Um, here's a spike that's one-sided. This is North Great Corn Grass, one-sided spike. <coughs> Here are two examples of two-sided spikes. This is a wheatgrass, or this is a wheatgrass over here, and this is a wild rye. In the wheatgrasses, there's one or sometimes two florets per node. In the wild rye, there's, there's two or more. <coughs> So the basic vegetation, vegetative units um, of a grass, so we've got the comb, that's the, the term for a stem on a grass or a sedge. 
And then a lot of grasses are rhizominous. Some are stoloniferous, so they have underground stems that, that spread. And up from these can spring rhizome tillers. Some grasses also form tufts by sending out crown tillers. Here's some examples. So things to look at, these are these are 60 mile an hour characteristics, things you can see in the ditch. So are they forming big clones like this miscanthus? Uh, are the, do the clones branch out and kind of become bushy like they do in this uh, uh, rate, the uh, marsh muley or like in this uh, Canada blue joint? Um, how many leaves are on a stem? That can be kind of important in some groups of grasses, in particular the wheat grasses. And then are the annuals or perennials? And who's got a good way to tell if something's an annual or a perennial when you bring grasses? Rip it out of the ground. Rip it out of the ground, right. See, this, this is a um, cheek grass, or cheek grass, a Bromus tectorum, and notice there's, just, there's not much root system to it. Easy to pull out of the ground. Same with this. Uh, annual bluegrass, really easy to pull them out of the ground. Now, if you try to pull out uh, like smooth brome, is that going to come up easy? No, it's, it's a perennial, it's got rhizomes, it's going to be pretty tough to yank out of the ground. And then, what's the growth form? So, here we have a densely clumped cespitose grass. Uh, this is tufted hair grass, Discampsia cespitosa. Here we have one that forms little tufts. And here, uh, this is uh, uh, white top um, is definitely rhizominous. So it's got these rhizomes if this one broke off into the ground. So kind of easy to see if they're tufted or not. And when it comes to how they're tufted, the form of tufting is also kind of important. And this is, this is from a, uh, a manual on ornamental grasses. So this is ways that uh, horticulturists describe some of the ornamental grasses. And I don't think it's worth really going over all of them, but you can see there these tufted bunch grasses can have really different forms. For example, this is a uh, furry drop seed over here. This has kind of this mounded form. And this is uh, Plains Bluegrass, Poerida. This has kind of an upright tufted form. So these forms can be kind of, these can be kind of good characteristics to key in on. Uh, and these are things you can see from a distance and, and pretty quickly tell if it's on, if it's on the site. When it comes to getting a little bit closer to the grasses, the sheaths, and in particular, <laughs> in particular the area where the leaf attaches to the sheath can tell you a lot about what the species is. Um, the basic unit of the comb is what we call a phytomere, and that consists of a node, a leaf sheath, a leaf blade, and an internode. So that's kind of the basic unit of the grass. Now, in some grasses, the sheaths are long enough that they overlap the nodes, and you'll see the nodes at all. In others, the nodes are longer and the sheaths show. And one thing to remember about grasses is, so when a grass starts growing, it sends up a leaf and then it keeps sending up more leaves from inside the sheath of the previous leaf. So you can get a whole bunch of leaves up, but the growth point is still like right at the ground. Okay, that's in particular why you have to mow your lawn repeatedly because you're sending up these shoots like that. And then, and you might have seen this like in a cornfield. You get these little tufts, these little corn plants about this tall with a whole bunch of leaves. And then all of a sudden, they start shooting up, shooting, they start bolting. And what that is is the inner nodes are expanding at that time. So the leaves are all kind of built, and then all of a sudden just explodes itself up. And you see that in the, like in the prairie black grass. It's really obvious with big blue stem. It just goes from being this tall to being like this tall. And it seems like really fast that it does this. So some characteristics to look at with the sheaths. First off, is the sheath closed, like in the smooth brome here? You know, it's fused shut just, just below the throat. Um, and this is this is a glyceria species, a managrass. This one's fused shut about right here. Um, then you've got one here, you can see the fringe of hair running down there. Uh, this is, I think that's, I gotta think for a second what that grass is. Uh, looks like, I think it's Elmus pubescens. So it kind of looks like it's got little worms here. But the sheath is open. You can see it's got a fringe of hairs on the edge. And then also another characteristic of these oracles, these are like little teeth that come out. So think of like the, the collar is kind of like this, and the oracles are kind of like the little flaps that wrap around there. Some grasses have them, some don't. But it's a good, it's a good characteristic to look at to, uh, 
help identify it. More features of the collar. Uh, this is green canary grass here. Uh, June grass here. This is one of the fescues. Uh, this is sand weed. But notice how on some of these, you've got these shoulders that are kind of extended out. That's what I call them anyways, these shoulders. So the leaf kind of flares out at the base to form these shoulders. In some, uh, they're not really that broad, they're kind of rounded. Uh, in like the reed canary grass, they're pretty squared off, and they're also really thick and cartilaginous. Here in the, in the uh, jute grass, they're not too well developed. Uh, in the prairie, or in the sand reed, there's barely any, anything to them at all. If we jump back one, you see like on the glyceria, doesn't really have any shoulders, but the sheath kind of just wraps around the, the comb. So, leaf blade, things to look at there. If you, if you can see it on this, the June grass has these ridges, so it's almost like they're corrugated. And you see this in quite a few grasses, especially grasses that grow in dry areas. And what that, what that is, is when the, when the plant starts to lose moisture, <coughs> that helps the leaf kind of roll up to reduce water loss. Uh, others, they're kind of hairy, like in the sand reed. Um, looking at the ligule, they can have some different forms. So the ligule is a little flap of either kind of a membrane or hairs. And the function of it is, so you've got this, this comb, and then you've got this leaf sheet that wraps around it. And what the ligule does is it keeps crap and bugs and stuff from getting down in there where it's going to damage the plant tissue. So it's kind of, it's kind of protection for that, that area inside the leaf sheet. So in some cases, it, the ligule can be a fringe of hairs. Uh, some prairie corn grass up here. Other cases, it's membranous. Um, and then notice, like, for example, this tufted hair grass, which is Campsie sesquitosa, notice how pointy that is. Um, that's a pretty good characteristic for this grass. It's, it's actually really easy to ID this grass vegetation because of that. Um, some like Hordium jubatum is a real thin membrane. And does anybody know what this one is? This is a pretty distinctive ligule on this grass. It's a prairie grass. Indian grass. Indian grass, yeah, so grass from New Kansas. So it's got what looks like horns on the side of the ligule. Uh, there are a few other grasses that have that, um, but not nearly to the extent of, of Indian grass. And then also the surfaces of the leaf. So notice the pubescence on this. This is Downing Well Bride, real light pubescence. Easy to miss, you kind of have to look for it. Um, but you know, if you kind of, and a good way to look for pubescence on leaves is just what I'm doing here is roll it over your finger and kind of twist it back and forth in the light. You get it just right, the light will kind of shine through the hairs and you can see these here. Um, and then a lot of grasses, like I said, in dry areas, they have these ridges and they're pretty stiff. So if you bend the leaf really sharply, it'll, it'll actually kind of crack. You can kind of crack those ridges. But that's a pretty good characteristic for telling apart certain look like species. And then, of course, the leaf tip. Everybody's familiar with the bow-shaped leaf tips of, of uh, the poas. Uh, any other grasses that have that you think of? The glycerias, the uh, manna grasses have bow-shaped leaf tips. And um, so does, um, okay, I think there it is for a second here. Um, so rare prairie, prairie grass is not coming to my head right now. Um, What do I think it's got the rare the rare prairie grass that oats no. in the northwest? Yeah. Isn't it it's, uh... <coughs> it's just not coming to my head right now? Um, uh, Vinula Hooker's wild oak grass. That's what it is. Hooker's wild oak grass. Um, it changed the Latin name on it. <coughs> but I can't think anybody think what the what the Latin name of that is right now? The hooker's wild oak grass, he looked over trying to <coughs> hook her eye, that's what it used to be. Um, but that's also got bow shaped leaf tips. Um, but that grows in extremely dry areas. Um, also look at the leaf tips, you notice this, so this is back towards sand reed again, these really long, thin, tapering leaf tips um, in comparison to this dicamp that has rather short, abruptly pointed leaves. So 
these are also, I mean, these are things you can see from a distance pretty easily. Uh, another vegetative thing to look at are the, looking at the cones. So the upright, like in this wood reed, just the stiff upright cone, or they kind of lax and drooping. This is a, uh, this is a uh, oak lustrous, foul meadow, foul meadow bluegrass. It kind of had, it's, it's a clump of bluegrass, but it starts to grow kind of long cones that drop over and start rooting at the nodes and spreading out that way. This is one of the cones that's kind of drooped over and start to root at the nodes. Do the cones come straight up or do they maybe twist out and up? Um, which is referred to as being either decumbent or, gen or geniculate. Uh, is the cone hollow or is it solid? Most grasses have hollow cones, um, but some, especially like big blue stem, little blue stem, Indian grass, they have solid cones. And so that's a thing you can look at there. Um, what are the colors of the nodes? And one thing I will note that most grasses, they're when, they, when they're fresh specimens, the nodes dry to a different color than they are when they're fresh. But some, some of them you'll see that they'll have a kind of a purplish node or it might be fuzzy or something. Like I said, there's something to look at there too. If you come with it. All right, now some species of, uh, of interest for wetland delineation. Um, I'm sure everybody's familiar with, with uh, regenerating grass, or Asia. Uh, really broad yellow shoulders. Leaves can be up to about three quarters of an inch wide. Um, you'll notice a lot of times when you see large areas of regenerary grass that's in flower, there might be different colors. Uh, that's because there's a lot of strains. Um, this is a very invasive species in, in wetlands and prairies. Um, there's <coughs> argument as to whether regenerary grass is native to the, the North America, um, but there's been at least 150 different varieties have been developed for use in different situations. And they were developed to be um, something you can plant in marginal wet ground to really take over fast, like for CRP and such. So I would argue that with 150 varieties that have been developed for aggressiveness, it's hard to say that it's really native anywhere. Uh, but it is definitely an ecosystem destroying invader. Um, and also incredibly difficult to control once it's in place. If, uh, has anybody? Try to control regenerate grass. Okay, on a very small scale, there's you can do stuff, but if you get on um, if you get large scale, it's hard to do anything without completely destroying the system. So, really tough thing to deal with. And fire does not seem to have a negative effect on that. So, um, but I was going to start with this because I'm sure we're all familiar with it. Uh, it doesn't branch, or very rarely, very very rarely branches. Only only once in a while you find a free plant that branches. So it's an upright cone. It forms monotypes, um, very aggressive, it's rhizomatous. So it spreads by both what we call phalanx spread, which is where the, the invasive front just keeps kind of moving, but it'll also send out long shoots, uh, what we call like the gorilla uh, spread, where it sends a shoot out a long ways and pops up another clump there. Um, the seeds are kind of sticky, they've got little hairs on them, so they stick to the people and animals that walk through them and then spread it out somewhere else. So. Um, so this is kind of a place to start. All right, so a group of plants I want to kind of talk about is the Aelopicurus. Um, these are the foxtail grasses. Um, not to be confused with Ceteria, which is also called foxtail. Um, so Aelopicurus, there's a few species worth noting here. Um, one I want to point out, or two actually I want to point out, are Aelopicurus rudinacea, which they call creepy meadow foxtail. And ill pures pretensis, which is I think it also called creeper meadow foxtail. Um, these are two non-native species which have been introduced for um, for use in, in wet pastures, especially. Um, Aelopicurus rudinaceus is not rec is not recognized in Minnesota yet. It's definitely absolutely present, but um, like if you look at the at the Bell Herbarium, they don't they don't list it as, as being present in their in their list. And as far as I know, the DNR still has not added it to their um, documented species in the state, but it is absolutely definitely present in Minnesota. You'll especially see it if you get out towards the Fargo area, the counties that kind of border North Dakota in that area, um, but it, has, it is spreading too. So I've seen it in uh, Yellow Medicine County, 
So it's it's definitely present. It's quite aggressive too. It flowers very early. Uh, the early flowers, the early stocks look like this, but then fairly soon the seeds turn black and it looks like this. I also see it deeper or fall now that I think about it. So once it's in once it's kind of matured, those black heads really stand out. In fact, I've had people call me and say, hey Rhett, what's the scratch with these black heads? And it's like, this is the guy right here. So definitely present, also pretty invasive. I'm not sure which wins between this and reed canary grass. Um, be an interesting experiment, but pretty pretty aggressive. Uh, it's very similar to Aloprocurus pretensis. This is documented and recognized to be in Minnesota. Very similar species. Uh, Aeropicurus pretensis has kind of a narrower inflorescence, but it can be longer. And the thing that really stands out is Aeropicurus rudinaceus, it doesn't have much for ons. And Aeropicurus pretensis, you can see these ons sticking out here. You can also see them kind of up here. So it's kind of a way to tell the two apart. Um, also non native, I guess I haven't seen Aeropicurus pretensis become particularly aggressive. Um, it can be dominant in areas where it's been planted. I haven't seen it be really aggressive. But Aelopicurus rubinaceus, I have seen that really kind of take over stream banks and ditches um, where it was not intentionally planted. So these are, these are ones to, to kind of watch for. And if you're working a lot of wetlands, you, you could run into these. Uh, a couple other, these, these are some of the little foxtails. They grow in kind of clumps. Um, Aelopicurus apolis and Aelopicurus carolinianus. These are both present in Minnesota. A uh, way to tell these apart, carolinianus has longer ons. Um, Aquilus just has really keen little short ons or might even not be noticeable. They grow in clumps. Um, Aelopicurus aquilus, uh, a lot of different wetland types. Aelopicurus carolinianus in Minnesota is mostly associated with pools and rock outcrops. That's where it's kind of mostly known from, though I have seen it in other places too. And notice the long ons <coughs> of carolinianus. Uh, some of the wild rice. So, I wanted to talk about the wild rice, especially because I think some of the species are extremely underreported in Minnesota and often thought to just be something else. Um, especially uh, Canada wild rye and Virginia wild rye, those are pretty common. So I think, um, oh, oh, this is going here. All right. Um, no, we're not anymore. Is that it? No. Um, and so, cattle wild rye and Virginia wild rye are really common and abundant and widespread. So, I think a lot of times some of these other species are just assumed to be one of these. So, cattle wild rye, this is a prairie species. Um, it can grow in moderately wet areas, but it goes a lot better in kind of drier prairies. Um, but notice the inflorescence, it kind of, it kind of arcs, you know, it's, it's bent over. Um, this particular one had three spikelets at the node there. And it's got pretty long ons, and they tend to kind of twist and curl as they mature. And you see these are starting to kind of do that twist and curl here. Um, most of the, the species of Elvis have oracles, sometimes very well developed, sometimes poorly developed. Uh, but it is a common characteristic of them. And Elvis virginicus, the inflorescence is really upright and stiff, doesn't flop over at all. Uh, there's two subspecies in Minnesota. Um, one has the sheet kind of extends into the inflorescence a little bit, so the inflorescence isn't fully exerted. Um, it may be that most of what we have in Minnesota is actually going to be something called Elmus jejunus at some point soon. I'm not sure what the taxonomy, the finalization of the taxonomy is, but I'm kind of switching some of that around. But pretty common. Um, another thing about Virginia wild rye is you notice these glooms down here. So there's a gloom back here, there's a gloom here. You see this one pretty well, this one's kind of hidden. But they're, they're thickened and they bow out at the base. And that's pretty obvious most of the time. Now here's one, so uh, who's familiar with those two species? I'm sure Carolyn's familiar. How about this one, Elmus riparius? Not so much yet, and I think it's, I think it's underreported for Minnesota because it looks so much like Canada wild rye. It looks very similar. Um, 
A few ways it differs. Uh, for one, it grows in kind of different areas. It does like floodplains, um, not so much prairie. But I've never seen this in the prairie, but just in floodplains. Uh, a little bit of a, of a weaker plant than Canada wild rye, a little bit less glaucus. Uh, the Canada wild rye, oops, see, it's kind of got that bloom, it's kind of glaucus. It's a little bit weaker, um, and it doesn't have the twisty uh, on so it's more straight. If you look at it, you might think it looks like halfway between Canada wild rye and bottle bush grass. So it's, that's kind of how I think. But a floodplain species, I've also noticed that it's on the thing, the ones that I've looked at, it's got a fringe of hair on the leaf, on the leaf mark, the sheath margin. Um, though I don't know how characteristic that is for the species, just the ones I've seen have had that in Minnesota. Uh, this is thought to be probably pretty under collected in Minnesota. Easy to miss, it just looks like you know the same old Canada wild rye. So, but it is worth, it is something worth kind of looking a little closer at here in floodplain. Um, Elvis velosus. This is, it's got a fairly upright inflorescence, so it can droop somewhat. I mean, it can, it can kind of arc a little bit. Um, but it, the leaf sheath and the leaf blade is very definitely because this, this picture got screwed up somehow, so I don't know what happened in PowerPoint deal. Um, but it, so if you think of that being twisted, I'll back up right, I don't know, PowerPoint did that to me. Um, but it, it can be kind of drooping, but it's not really lax. It's also generally quite a bit smaller in stature uh, compared to um, Virginia Wild Rye, which also has kind of an upright fluorescence. And then this one is one to be on the lookout for too. Also, man, this is another PowerPoint screen that I too. Um, this is Elmus Bigandii. This is another species that likes floodplain forests and kind of the moisture side of forests. Not really wet, wet areas, but fairly wet areas. Or just not really dry areas either. Um, this looks a lot like Canada Wild Rye, but notice this inflorescence is really droopy, and it can be really long too. It's very, very lax. It's not arcing, it's actually drooping. Also, the leaves, there's uh, a lot, there's more leaves per column on Elvis Wigandii. It's a pretty, generally a pretty big plant, and the leaves can be um, about three centimeters wide sometimes, or at least like an inch, like an inch wide. So it's a, it's a pretty broad leaf plant, um, but a very droopy inflorescence. But I think it's been missed because it looks a lot like Canada Wild Rye. And then the, these pictures got kind of screwed up too. Um, so that's not even, like, this is not even the right picture for this slide. Um, some of the like serious species, what they have in common is they have closed sheaths, um, boat shaped leaf tips, the, the leaves tend to hug close to the stem, so they don't really spread out from it. They're really kind of tight against the stem. Um, these pictures are looking really much good here. Uh, here's, yeah, these aren't the right pictures either. Uh, the little great pictures, looks like kind of messed up. Um, all right. Huh, I don't know how, what that, how it did that to me. Let me. Let me just try something real quick here. As a backup, I tried to. Uh, I swear it was it was okay when I put it on here. So okay, well forget that then. So okay, so looking at the glycerias, um, they've got boat shaped leaf tips. The leaves tend to kind of hug close to the stem, so they don't they don't spread out. They're pretty tight against the stem. They generally have kind of a yellowish green color that stands out a little bit. That sort of sets them apart from some of the sedges and stuff they grow in. They're all obligates. And I've got some up here to look at um, if you want to compare them side, side by side. So I've got all four native species to the state here. Um, another species I wanted to point out is this one. 
you have template with this. So this is white top. Anybody familiar with this? Scolocloa festucasia. It's yeah. It's a it's a wetland plant. Um, if you don't know to look for it though, it, it kind of blends in with other stuff, and it, from a distance, it might look a little like green canary grass. Um, obviously, the inflorescence up close looks really different, but this is one that you can have a large patch of it, hundreds of stems, and maybe one stem or two is flowering. So it's pretty common that this just doesn't flower, it just grows vegetatively. But it's a fairly stout grass. From a distance, you might mistake it for reed canary grass. Up close, you probably wouldn't because it's, a, it's got a much thicker leaf. Um, but up close, it looks a lot like prairie corn grass. And it's got kind of stiff leaves and it's kind of a stiff plant. But prairie corn grass has a hair-like inflorescence, like hairy inflorescence, and white top has a membranous inflorescence. Um, also, I think you know it's it's missed a lot because it's not flowering. So if you find it in vegetative condition, it might just be something you miss and don't really think much of. Um, let's see. So I was going to give some time to. Uh, let you guys kind of look at my, did anybody bring, everybody bring a hand lens, I take it? Anyone? Okay, I've got, I've got a few that you can use. Um, here, so. um, but another grass I kind of wanted to point out is woolly cup grass. Who's familiar with this one? Okay, this stuff, it's an annual grass, and up until last year, I wasn't too concerned with it being invasive in prairies, because generally annuals just can't compete with with the perennial uh, prairie grasses, but I no longer think that that's the case. I've seen this really take off in a few native prairies. Um, in one case, it was kind of close to a road. In another case, it was way out in the middle of, of, of a prairie, and I don't know how it got there, but it was kind of formed a dense patch, almost almost as thick as reed canary grass. You wouldn't think it with an annual. Um, on rock outcrop systems, this is a terrible invasive weed. It takes over rock outcrops and forms a mat about this, about three feet high, and really outcompetes everything else in these rock outcrop systems. Um, I suspect that turkeys eat the inflorescences and then spread it. That's kind of my suspicion. Um, is how, and how that it's getting spread out to some, some areas. Uh, it's got a pretty tough seed that you could probably get through, uh, you know, if the turkey ate enough seed, so it'll probably get through its gut. I suspect that that's part of how this is spreading. Um, but it is, it is something to watch for. Uh, if you get it, if you see it in your garden or something, you want to be absolutely sure you pull it or you're going to fight forever. Um, but also in natural areas, especially in natural areas that have a little bit of disturbance. Okay, um, before we start looking at plants, and you can turn the lights back on. I've already been asked a few, by a few people about um, good books for grasses. It's a brutsome. All right, obviously the floor of North America is an excellent resource. Uh, great line drawings, really fantastic descriptions. Um, right now, it's pretty hard to access on the internet. The other published volumes of the Florida North America are available pretty easily, but this one, there was a website dedicated to grasses out of, out of Utah, but it's, the website's been down for about a year. Um, you can still access the information, it's just, it takes a little more time, there are instructions. Uh, if you Google FNA grasses, you'll, you'll find it. Um, but, very, you know, if you, if you want to get into grasses, this is kind of a must have. It's really good descriptions. Uh, Gleason Cronquist, of course, uh, pretty good for eastern stuff. This doesn't get everything that's in Minnesota. Some of the western species that show up in like the western tier states uh, might not show up in here. Fairly good descriptions. Um, not my favorite keys. They're, they're decent, but um, a little bit tough to use. Obviously, Florida, North America, it covers all North America, so the keys are pretty long and kind of difficult to get through. Uh, some of them get to be pretty technical, but the descriptions are fantastic. An old classic. Hitchcock's Manual of Grass of the United States. 
So this is um, this is out of copyright, so you can get it through Dover Books really cheap. It's older, it's kind of outdated. Uh, decent, I mean, you'd have to look up what the new name of the species is if you use this. Some of the keys are pretty user friendly. Some of them will drive you absolutely nuts because these asks, you just can't figure out what this characteristic is. So some is pretty hyper technical, but still pretty good, and it's cheap. You know, this isn't a really expensive book, so I think probably get both, both volumes for like 20 bucks, maybe less. So it's a it's you know, Dover Publishing puts it out. They they take old books that are out of copyright and and so are the cheap. So yeah, it looks like I paid 13.95 for this one. Um, field Guide to Wisconsin Grasses, this is pretty fantastic. There's, the species descriptions are, are lacking. In fact, most of, most of the species don't have descriptions. But there are really, really good keys. And in the keys, I noticed that there's quite a few field usable characteristics. Um, so, highly recommend it. Really nice pictures. Uh, once again, it won't cover everything that's in Minnesota, especially if you start getting out of the prairie region. There's a lot of stuff that won't be there, but it is Really pretty good though. Um, actually, it's, it's really fantastic. It's a great book. If you can find it, uh, the Floor of the Great Plains is one of my favorite grass books. It's got excellent species descriptions. Really fantastic species descriptions. The keys work. It, it you can work stuff on the keys. You don't get that thing where it says, is it 2.5 to 6 millimeters or is it 4.4 4 to 8 millimeters, and it's always like between 4.4 and 4 6. It doesn't, you don't run into that. I mean, we've all run into that. That drives a person nuts. Um, these are really good keys, uh, really excellent species descriptions, um, a great book. Covers most of Minnesota. If you get into the forester region of Minnesota, you might run into stuff that you won't have in here, but this is a really good book. Actually, these two together are really great. Um, because they kind of cover the different parts of Minnesota that the other, the other does. Uh, the problem with the floor of the Great Plains, it's been out of print for a while. And I've heard rumors that they're going to update it and reprint it. Um, so if you want to buy this, was well, anybody trying to buy this recently? How much was it, Scott? I think about 60. I'm just adding to my collection. So. Oh, no, I, last time I looked on it. Uh, like, I, I found it for about 60 bucks. Really, that's pretty good. Last time I looked, it was around 400. Oh, you used to be able to get some forestry supplies. So I have a few copies from back in the day. Yeah, I, I think I paid 35 for it when I when I got mine, but that was quite a long time ago. So now it's out of print, but it's a really fantastic book. Um, if you're all familiar with Chatty, um, kind of took stuff from other sources and kind of put it all together. Uh, there's, I mean, this is handy thing to carry in the field. There, I have found a few mistakes in keys and some omitted species and stuff like that that aren't in the keys. Um, but mostly it's just you know, taken from other sources and put all one, in one place. And then like I mentioned before, I've been kind of put together a field guide for grasses in Minnesota. Uh, I think I'm up to about, 100 and, about 130 species covered. Not all of them get a full coverage, but they're at least mentioned. Um, and I continue to work on it. If anybody's interested in this, shoot me an email and I'll send you a copy. Um, uh, electronic copy. So. Okay. Uh, yeah, sorry the slides got screwed up at the end. Any, uh, any questions before we kind of break out and, and look at plants? Yes. Yeah. Very often we are out in the fields before there are seed heads. <laughs> yep. So. <laughs> That's <laughs> kind of why I wanted to show up. What advice do you have of those guys, those keys, have legumes. Legumes. that have legumes? <laughs> I, that's one thing I tried to do in my books is <laughs> list as many vegetative characteristics as possible for telling species apart. Sometimes all we have to do to get that is send you an email. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> um, and okay. I've got the I've got the standard DNR email, Brett.johnson at state state So um, but yeah, something like the characteristics I was I was mentioning there. And the problem is a lot of books uh, they don't really mention vegetative characteristics much at all. So, um, and yeah, if you work in the field, you've got kind of a limited window when you've got flowers or fruits. So, um, so yeah, but like, like I was showing with some of the different characteristics to look for. Once you get to know the species in your area, you can kind of get a sort of a shell form. Any other questions? I guess, is it 
there any are there any tactics in your slides that you want to just say something quickly about, even though we might not get a lot of photos? Oh, uh, sure. Yeah, I just I really had a few left. Uh, Tori Cloa Palada is. This is one that I think might be easy to miss, um, and it's a, it's not a, I wouldn't say it's a common species, but it might be more common than suggested, it's state special concern. Um, it's a, it's a wetland plant, an obligate, uh, it can, there's a couple forms in Minnesota, there's a, a taller subspecies um, and a shorter subspecies, but they both have foliage that's just a little bit more yellowish green than the surrounding vegetation usually. So they kind of stand out. And it tends to form, uh, as you can see from this, it tends to form mats. And I've seen it growing on like stream banks, um, forested wetlands that stay wet for a while, not real ephemeral stuff, stuff that stays wet for a while, but not, not deep water. I found it on, on some floating mats um, and sometimes on mud flats. So, this is one to kind of, especially like if you're a little further north of Minnesota in the Forested region, this would be one to kind of look for. It, it'd be very easy to think this was one of the glycerea species. They look pretty similar. Uh, I already showed you, has these pictures got just all mixed around here. Um, but I showed you white top already. Uh, I don't have Phragmites with me. Um, because I, I don't have any mounted specimens because they're huge and they're bothered with it. Um, there's both a native and non-native subspecies of, of uh, Frank Mike, let me see if I can find some of like this up here. So this is Phragmites australis, uh, so this is Americana, so this is australis. So the native Phragmites, it forms dense clusters, but not as dense. And the flowering heads, the inflorescence, is a lot smaller and wispier than in the non-native, which is a more robust species, uh, generally quite a bit taller, uh, stouter stems usually, and it's got this it's, I think of the inflorescence being the size of like a kid's nerf ball. It's almost like the size and shape of it, but really robust plant. Um, vegetatively, the, the non-native has a longer ligule. Um, and also the non-native subspecies, the culm tends to be yellowish, and the sheath did, tends to stick on it more, whereas the native one, the, sheath, the lower sheaths especially, they tend to kind of break off and expose this bright red stem. So this is, this is one you can see, this is a drive-by at 60 miles an hour and be able to see it kind of characteristic. Uh, also, just the, the robustness of the non-native really stands out. Um, and the University of Minnesota is really kind of interested in getting a better handle on how widespread the non-native frag is in, in, the, uh, in the state. So they've got a website that's got some stuff on it, but um, it's probably, you know, if you find it in a, in a new place, it's kind of a long way from where it's been reported, it might be worth getting a collection from the University of Minnesota. I think that kind of takes us to the end. Um,
Okay, so here's our white top. Um, you notice on the drawing there, it tends to have a little less pronounced, but it's got those horns, kind of like in, in uh, Indian grass, though not quite as pronounced and not quite as thick. The leaves tend to be kind of kind of tough and rich, so it is it is it's kind of like prairie corn grass, where it's kind of hard to break a leaf. With. And then this big open inflorescence kind of stands out for this as if it is present, but oftentimes the inflorescence is. Any other questions? Which grass is your favorite? <laughs> oh, no, no, no. Um, probably slender core grass or prairie drops. Those are both kind of grasses. Is there a non-native Canada joint? Uh, not that I know. There are um, there are some that are planted in like horticultural plantings that are Calmagrastus, uh, and they're actually Get to be pretty, um, pretty common. I kind of any ornamental grass scares me just a little bit because grass is a pretty good at being invasive. Um, I got none that I know. Does anybody else know any? Yeah, I'm not, not, I'm not familiar with any, any other um, invasive. Uh, interesting thing, I did see uh, Canada Blue Joy last summer that had pubescent sheaths. Uh, has anybody else ever seen that? Look for it. It was kind of a weird thing. I couldn't find it in any floras, um, but it's definitely what it was. Yeah. I don't know if this question is too broad, but how would you go about distinguishing canicums that you were seeing in like wetland areas, um, especially in wetland areas that might be a little bit like in the transition elements too? Like, what are you looking for to distinguish species? Uh, so, a few of the common ones you can find, especially more open wetlands, are like. Uh, Kind of capillary, which is going to be really pubescent, have tiny, tiny spikelets. Um, the if you're in an area, well, I guess it really could be almost anywhere anymore. Um, switchgrass, Panicum brigatum, it's going to have a little patch of hairs on on the leaf, kind of close to the sheath on the upper surface, uh, and they usually persist until late summer, and then they kind of get worn off. But it's usually pretty obvious if I can. <coughs> So I was up the way out and this was very hairy capillary. That's, that's that's really common and widespread. Um, Panicum dichotomochlorum. This is one that you can find in kind of open open wetland areas. Um, kind of also kind of a weedy annual. Uh, notice the base really kind of spreads out, but this is not hairy like panicum capillary. <laughs> Uh, Panicum malasium. This one you're really probably only likely to find. This is one where the, the there's two subspecies. Um, one of them the the spikelet breaks open and releases the seed. This one you're probably only going to really find it in farm wetlands or really weedy areas like edges of ditches or something. Um, I've only ever seen it grown in pretty open muddy areas. And the Panicum brigatum is a perennial, and it's got this this patch of hairs right down here at the base of the leaf. And it can stretch, you know, it can stretch a couple inches up the leaf. So that does by the by the end of the season, it's kind of hard to see because it just the hairs kind of disintegrate by that time. Sandbird, yeah. Uh, Why would it have a, is that like a defensive mechanism, of course, or adaptation? I think that's, that's part of it. Obviously, birds aren't going to want to eat sandbird. Um, is that more of a rare species nowadays? Or? No, 
it's well, it's not such a <coughs> you know, pretty major weed in uh, I remember getting those in my shoelaces years ago playing baseball. Yeah, it used to be a really a pretty major uh, crop weed, but with Roundup Ready everything, it's kind of knocked it back. But yeah, it likes open sandy areas. Um, probably one of the two most painful plants in Minnesota. Um, those burrs are wicked, and they stick into your skin and break off, of course. And they ever get into your, yeah, around your ankles or. Um, yeah, it, it really sucks. It's an annual. It is native, um, but yeah, it's an annual. It's pretty well protected. Uh, the other most painful plant in Minnesota would be what? Or most painful grass? Rice cut grass. Yeah, that's ridiculous. That stuff. So, um, this is actually a, a little bird. It's got all the same uh, parts as as its fuel spike was all kind of packed together in there. So yeah, like defensive mechanism, but also a way to transport seeds around. Just stick it into animals and then get it dropped out somewhere else. Be kind of a mean prank to plant on a neighbor or something. Throw some bees in your yard. Your neighbor keeps bringing their dog on you. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, any other ones? Yeah. Uh, heavily grazed bluegrass, distinguishing between like compressed it and pretentious, is it really as simple as like looking at the column? If you can, yeah, if it's heavily grazed, it, be, it might be pretty tough um, because the column might not be big enough to see it. But uh, compressor will have a really distinctly flat column. Um, if it's really heavily grazed down, it might be pretty tough. Uh, the com compressor tends to be a little bit more glaucous in general. It's actually kind of helpful. But, um, if they're if they're if they're not extremely grazed down, um, you know, compressa has more upright inflorescence in its present. The leaves tend to be shorter. Uh, Kentucky bluegrass leaf, the leaves can get super long if they're not if they're not grazed or something. These tend to have pretty short leaves, um, but the stem the stem is flat. Though. Heavily grazed grasses are really tough. You know, if they're like this tall, um, some of them you can tell, like the the, um, the, the, the gram grasses, um, but some are pretty tough to tell. It's a very challenging kind of situation. Great questions. Yeah, um, sure. <laughs> I, thought I, I thought I had some pictures actually. Okay, here's, this is the kind of flow from Scali, um, the common non-native barnyard grass. Um, one time it was called million dollar grass, kind of encourages to be planted in winter and stuff. Um, telling this apart from the kind of flow of your, or kind of flow of your cotta, which is uh, a native, there's a few things you can go by. Um, they can, they can be pretty tough to tell apart. In the keys, they always talk about the fertile lemma. So this is a, a panicoid grass, so it's got the, the gloom, gloom, sterile lemma, fertile lemma. Um, they talk about the tip of the fertile lemma is kind of soft. It has a little ring of hairs on the kind of cloacrus galley, and it's pointed, and 
and stiffer and hairless on Canicola muricata. And that is something with practice you can see. If you go to, um, Iowa State University has uh, some, some information on grasses native to Iowa. They've got some really excellent pictures of this on that. Um, if you just Google Iowa State grasses, you'll probably find it. Um, and they've got a lot of great pictures of other grasses too. Another thing that works is you can of call a cruise dally. So these, these individual uh, lemons and, and uh, blooms are are hairy on most species. On the Canicola, gra Canicola cruise galley, the hairs have small or no little pustules in the base, <coughs> whereas in the Canicola muricata, almost every hair has a big pustule, pustule at the base, which is, which is like a blister at the base of the grass, or the base of the hair. That's pretty decent for telling them two apart also. That's a little easier to see than the dilemma. But Otherwise, they look pretty similar. Echanoclog cruscali almost always has geniculate bases, meaning it kind of spreads out and then up. So it almost always has that. Echanoclog muricata, a lot of times it just grows with upright individual cones, but that's not perfect either. So those two species are really challenging to tell apart. But a quick question, Carol. So, so the cruscali is not, it's not native to species. Would you consider that to be invasive though? I would not because it just tends to grow in leaky places, um, like like fields and such. Before round of pretty crops, this was a, this could be a pretty big problem. Um, I wouldn't consider it invasive because it's just it's just really kind of weedy. Um, it's generally where it gets thick and dense is, is like farm wetlands that you know farm through and grounds it all out and then weeds come up. Um, those kind of places or ditches and such. I haven't seen it really take over in areas that have dominated by prairie things. Okay, it's a bit of Like I'm just wondering if I'm walking, assuming it's cruise valley and there are some um, native. There, if it's grown in a real weedy area, like a ditch or a farm, like a farm wetland or something, then it's probably cruise valley. Okay. Um, if you're in a decent native area and you find it, then you might consider Miracata. Can you talk a little bit about some of the distinguishing characteristics between the cicarias? Sure. Um, yeah. So. All right, we'll start with Ceteria faberi. That's got hairs on the margins of the leaf sheet. It's got a fairly large inflorescence a lot of times, and the inflorescence droops pretty good. Kind of arches. <coughs> uh, this one's kind of immature, so it wasn't quite all the way on the sheet, but it tends to arch about like about like that. Uh, that's uh, Soteria Fabra, my favorite smock scale. Foxtail, Ceteria pumula. Notice the real wispy hairs all over the <coughs> leaf surface. Um, this tends to have an inflorescence that's either upright or maybe nodding over just a little bit. Um, the two subspecies of green foxtail in Minnesota, one grows about this tall and grows kind of in a lot of, air, a lot of different places you see it. Uh, the other grows about this tall and looks a lot like Faber's foxtail, except it's got a much, it's got a much lower <coughs> upright inflorescence. It also has all these wispy hairs. Um, the taller one you usually see like at the edges of farm fields, like where the where one year the roundup <coughs> probably got sprayed a little bit too far and killed the grass along the fence row, and the next year you'll have the uh, green fox still coming up. What was the taller one? Was Actually, I was just showing you a yellow foxtail. 